under the new Veterans Charter, which we increased the, the PIA supplement, that was the focus of my attention as Minister. And a vast majority of veterans receiving the permanent impairment allowance have operational stress injuries. It's been something the Canadian Armed Forces has been struggling with. I talked about it on the 20th anniversary of the crash of Swiss Air, the first time I ever heard operational stress injury. That's why we were opening operational stress injury clinics, not administrative offices that people still don't use. It's amazing they're still talking about those issues. It shows they don't understand it, Mr. Speaker. So, as I said last week, if that minister showed some leadership, Mr. Speaker, I would rise in this House and thank him on behalf of my constituents, on behalf of veterans, to show that if a mistake is made within the department, he will own, acknowledge, and rectify that mistake. And if they don't, they will hear us every day because we are listening to Canadians. We are listening to military families and veterans who are discouraged, are disappointed. It's time for them to show ownership, Mr. Speaker. Stop this shameless treatment for Christopher Garner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Questions and comments. Question the Honourable Member for Winnipeg North. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. You know, it's, it's interesting to see the former minister take the type of position, and he has been somewhat consistent, and I'd like to point out that consistency. But first, I sat in opposition for years. Well, he, as a minister, allowed those offices for vets in every region of our country to be remain closed, even though hundreds, if not thousands, of veterans called upon Stephen Harper and his government and him as the minister to reopen those offices, and he completely refused to listen to what the veterans actually had to say, uh, Mr. Speaker. But there is a difference between the Conservatives and the Liberals. You see, we value our veterans and the need for privacy. I'm, I'm having a hard time hearing the question. I just want to... Okay. No, normally, I just want to remind the members, when the speaker stands, normally it's quiet. Normally. I just want to remind everyone, I'm trying to hear the question, and I can't because of the heckling going back and forth. The Honourable Member for Winnipeg uh, North. Yeah. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Mr. Speaker. You know, the Conservatives back in uh, 2010, they'll remember Mr. Bria. Mr. Bria was an individual that had some issues with regards to the Conservative uh, Party, uh, Mr. Speaker. And because of that, the minister at the time goes and gets all sorts of uh, briefing, including the medical history of Mr. Bria. And then there's information that was leaked to the media dealing with this case. Bottom line is, is that the Conservative Party had to apologize for breaching the privacy of a vet. I'm wondering if the member would, across the way would not acknowledge that there is, it is important that we protect the privacy of our veterans. Good question. Good. Now, I had a hard time hearing the question. I'm hoping I don't have a hard time hearing the answer. The Honourable Member for Durham. Mr. Speaker, the member from Winnipeg North said we should apologize to veterans. He should apologize to veterans for eroding their trust with putting a murderer ahead of veterans in life. He also said they value our veterans. He's a veteran. He served as an air traffic controller. I thanked him publicly for his service, as I will today. I think all parliamentarians value our veterans. But right now, with the Garnier case, only the Conservatives are listening to our veterans, Mr. Speaker. They are outraged by the fact a mistake was made, and rather than rectify the mistake, we see privacy concerns. We suggest we're, we're not serving veterans by serving someone who never wore a day in uniform. I asked that member who has served to go speak to the Winnipeg police, to volunteer firefighters outside of Winnipeg, and ask them whether we should be respecting a victim like Catherine Campbell by helping her murderer or rectifying the error that was made at Veterans Affairs. Questions and comments? Question and commentaire, l'honorable député d'Abitibi Temis. The honorable member for Abitibi Temis Kamang. Thank you very much. Given that my colleague was Minister for Veterans Affairs, I would like to know, in his opinion, what should be the criteria to use to determine eligibility 
for the child of a veteran to receive benefits or not. In the case that is before us, why Mr. Garnier would not meet those criteria. The Honourable Member for Durham. Merci, Monsieur le Président, et je veux remer thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I would like to thank the Honourable Member for her question. Canadian Armed Forces, and I've been proud to, to do some veterans' work with the member from Abitibi to Miskaming, and I appreciate that. Good question. The determination on benefits is a subjective one, so someone at Veterans Affairs made a decision. It was a wrong decision, Mr. Speaker, because there are no programs whatsoever for adult, non-dependent children. Mr. Garnier was in his late 20s, mid to late 20s, when he committed a horrific crime. He was not a dependent child. Even if there was a dependent child, Mr. Speaker, most of the programming, either family-based counselling or some programs with the child directly, relate to stress, operational stress, transference injury from the veteran in the home, the mom or dad that has an injury. That can affect the wellness of the family, Mr. Speaker. I support those programs. This is not a circumstance where those programs would be eligible because the PTSD, in the words of the killer's father, do not come from his service in uniform. They come from committing a horrific crime as an adult. That minister should get to know the files in his own department before he embarrasses himself day after day defending a clear error. There, there. Resuming debate, the Honourable Member for Brandon Suris. I want to remind the Honourable Member that he'll have 10 minutes to give his speech, and the questions will uh, take place after we return. The Honourable Member. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Today, our Conservative caucus is shining a giant spotlight on an egregious error that needs to be rectified. Since the news of a convicted murderer receiving assistance from Veteran Affairs Canada, the reaction from veterans and everyday Canadians has been swift and overwhelmingly negative. Some are in shock that such a thing could happen. One would think that a person who approved this paperwork would have immediately took this up the chain of command and said, something must be done. I would hope that they said the policy should be changed and the decision must not stand. Well, no one faults the original crafter of the policy, as who could have ever imagined that Veteran Affairs funding could ever flow to a convicted murderer. There is never a wrong time to do the right thing, and the House is now seized with this issue. We are here now, and let's deal with this matter once and for all. Now, when the news went public about what happened, what had happened, I thought there had to be a terrible mistake. I agree with the Minister of Veteran Affairs when he said that people are frustrated with how this happened. I know he understands this, that this is inappropriate. But what I don't know is if he wants to change the policy. But like most Canadians, I shake my head and wonder how could a convicted murderer be able to receive funding from Veteran Affairs Canada so he could go through private treatment while in jail after he brutally killed an off-duty police officer? But somehow it happened. Veteran Affairs Canada is actually paying for his private treatment. And somehow the promised review of why this was carried out is taking weeks to finish. And somehow the Prime Minister saw fit to stand up in this House and refuse to answer questions. Well, I have news for the Prime Minister. Not, e not only will our Conservative caucus continue to stand up and ask the tough questions, we will force him to vote on it. We want the Prime Minister and the entire Liberal caucus to support our motion to revo revoke Veteran Affairs funding that is going to take to pay rather the private treatment of a convicted murderer. Someone who never served a day in the Canadian Armed Forces. He never wore the uniform. He never served our country. And most certainly is not entitled to any private treatment paid through Veteran Affairs. With this motion, we want the Prime Minister to send a strong message to the entire veterans community that what happened is wrong 
and it must be fixed immediately. It will also be an opportunity for every member to be on the record on where they stand and if they want to fix this egregious application of the Veteran Affairs policies. And we have to seriously think that if we do not revoke this funding, what sort of message will it send to every veteran out there who is wondering how this could have happened? The quote retired Sergeant Colin, to quote retired Sergeant Colin Saunders, who organized a protest this year on Parliament Hill over veterans' benefits, he said, and I quote, in this circumstance, I find it really hard to chew on that we're spending taxpayers' money like that to help someone when we also have veterans that are having a really hard time getting treatment through VAC. Certainly, there's a lot of veterans whose family members need help or need services, and they're not getting it." End quote. And he's right. Sadly, there are those who are currently appealing decisions on why they are not receiving benefits. But yet, Veteran Affairs has the funding to pay for PTSD treatment for a convicted murderer. To stress the failure of how this happened, if the convicted murderer had in fact served in the Canadian Armed Forces, he would have been kicked out with a dishonorable discharge, and he probably would not have ever received benefits. But in this case, because the convicted murderer wasn't actually a veteran, he gets to continue to receive assistance. To quote another veteran, Pedrick Cousineau, who is the founder of Pause for Thought, which helps place service dogs to veterans who need them, said, and I quote, how can you have a department who will bend over willy-nilly and yawn to support that? Who will drag its feet toward supporting service dogs for veterans? He's absolutely right. This is the government that had almost three years to ensure that veterans suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder can be paired with service dogs. And we just learned that there will be further delays as a result of their inaction. Our veterans deserve programs and benefits designed to meet their ever-evolving needs. And yet, under this government, we have seen nothing but more backlogs and delays. The Liberals have repeatedly demonstrated they don't intend on honoring all the promises they made to veterans during the 2015 election campaign. While we are not here debating the promises the Liberals have failed to implement, we are here to rectify a very serious error in the application of veterans' benefits. This decision is wrong on so many levels, and the longer we take to fix it, the more veterans and Canadians will continue to lose faith in the system. They are losing faith in the Prime Minister, who had the gall to tell veterans, quote, they are asking for more than we can give. End quote. Not only did he give that flippant remark, he refused to apologize for it. The reason why that comment stung and made people's blood boil is that we see waste and out-of-control spending on a weekly basis. Today's debate is just another example of misplaced spending that should never have happened. While the Liberal government just wrote a $4.5 billion check to a Texas oil company, they have a very difficult time keeping the promises they made to our veterans. And the veteran community is paying attention. They will not soon forget the Prime Minister's comment or overlook payments to provide private treatment to a convicted murderer. They are deeply upset that after the Prime Minister promised not to take veterans to court, he did exactly that. They're angry that he didn't keep his promise to establish lifelong pensions as an option for injured veterans. Well, I know the Prime Minister does not like facing these tough questions. That's what Parliament is for. He can continue to throw insults and downplay the whole fiasco, but we will, stay, but we will not stay silent. We are here to hold the government's feet to the fire and make them accountable for their actions. Shrugging, off this, off, shrugging this off pardon me, and pretending that it doesn't matter will not make this problem go away. We want the funding to cease immediately, and we want the policy changed so this situation never happens again.
We would be shirking our responsibilities as parliamentarians if we did not fix this in the most expeditious manner. I implore my Liberal colleagues to vote in favour of this motion. Stand with us. Send a strong message that funding meant for veterans should never go to convicted murderers. Let us be united in condemning what has transpired and pledge to never let it happen ever again. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Here, here. The Honourable Member for Brandon Suris will have five minutes of questions coming to him when we resume debates. Statements by members. Déclaration des députés. The Honourable Member for Saanich Gulf Islands. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's an honour to rise today in this place, and I begin by acknowledging we're on the traditional territory of the Algonquin's people. We are here today because today at the University of Victoria, it marks the beginning of a historic program. There is the launch of a long-awaited historic first. The first, the world's first law program, a degree-granting program in Indigenous law. And I couldn't be more honoured to be able to recognise today, I would have liked to have been there with them, but John Burroughs, who, is, who holds the Canada Research Chair in Indigenous Law, Val Napoleon, who is also uh, engaged with this issue as the Law Foundation Chair in Aboriginal Justice and Governance, are launching a program that is rooted in the earth, looking to Indigenous law as well as common law to direct Canada's future. To them I say, Haishka Siam, I raise my hands to you, all honour. Thank you, Megwich. The Honourable Member for Ottawa Vanier. Mr. Speaker, it's National Coaches Day. To thank their coaches for all they do for our kids and our communities. As a mother of three children who all have marvelous coaches, I have seen firsthand how important they are in shaping our youth. Through their work, coaches contribute to make Canada a healthy country. Competing in the Olympics, our coaches are always there to support, inspire, and guide us not only in sport, but in life as well. We know that most coaches are volunteers who contribute their time to help our youth from across the country to learn. So this week, it's our turn to encourage them. Let's say thanks to them. Thank you from the bottom of our hearts for all the good they do. All members to celebrate coaches using hashtag thanks coach, Moklik, merci coach. Merci, Monsieur le Président. The Honourable Member for Lambton, Kent, Middlesex. Mr. Speaker, we know that agriculture is the backbone of the Canadian economy. The international plowing match was held last week in Chatham Kent near Pancour on 850 acres of land in Lambton Kent Middlesex. This annual event is one of the best in Canada that celebrates our agriculture industry and provides learning experiences for urban and rural folks and thousands of school children. Mr. Speaker, it would not have been possible without the help of 1,000 volunteers who dedicated time land and resources. In particular, I want to thank Jean-Marie and, Le, and Lucille Laprise, the host farmers and co-chairs Leon Leclerc and Darren Caniff. The IPM was a great opportunity to showcase one of the most productive agriculture areas in Canada and talk about the career opportunities in our agriculture industry. Thanks again to all the volunteers. Bravo. The Honourable Member for Coast of Bay Central Notre Dame. Mr. Speaker, I rise today in memory of a truly great man, Reverend Wesley Oak, who passed away on September 16th at the age of 96. Growing up in Notre Dame Bay, Reverend Oak was one of the last World War II veterans from Newfoundland and Labrador, having served in the 166th Newfoundland Field Regiment. He fought mainly in Italy, but was also active in England and Africa. He spoke openly about the time he spent serving and has provided us with honest stories and the hard truths of what wartime was like. After serving in the war, he was ordained as a minister in the United Church for 22 years, serving God and his congregation. One thing that Reverend Oak will always be remembered for is a fundraiser he did for Gander's Heritage Memorial Park. He raised $35,000 at the age of 92 
and at 92, he also went skydiving at 10,000 feet. Wow. He leaves behind his wife Myrtle, with whom today he would have celebrated his 72nd wedding anniversary. We will always miss you, Reverend Oak, and for making this country better and safe. The Honourable Member for Elmwood, Transcona. People in Northeast Winnipeg are fed up with scam phone calls. They're among the thousands of Canadians that every year are harassed on the phone by unscrupulous con artists. Some fall victim to these schemes, losing their life savings and their sense of trust in the world around them. My office is receiving more and more reports of these calls. The people on the line pretend to be in a position of authority and threaten legal action if their target doesn't agree to pay a bogus fee. Some people are getting one or more calls a day and they're reaching their wits end. While Canadians are encouraged to report these scams to the RCMP's Canadian Anti-Fraud Centre, too often they're met with a busy signal. When that happens, the information that should help international law enforcement find and shut these guys down doesn't get to where it needs to go. Clearly, the Canadian Anti-Fraud Centre needs more resources to do its job protecting Canadians from these ill-willed and irritating invasions of their privacy. I call on the government to do so. Thank you. Honourable Member for Sydney, Victoria. Mr. Speaker, September is Dystonia Awareness Month. It is estimated that 50,000 Canadians have this disease, which is the third most common movement disorder following tremors and Parkinson's disease. Those with dystonia suffer from painful involuntary muscle contractions on any part of their body, including their arms, legs, face, and vocal cords. On top of this physical pain, those with dystonia often experience depression, anxiety, and social phobias. Mr. Speaker, there is a low awareness of dystonia, and the biggest challenge can be getting the proper diagnosis. There is no known cure for the disease, but we must raise the awareness. This disease has been brought to my attention by a, by a fellow Cape Bretoner, Jason Young. He was instrumental in getting the world's largest fill in Sydney lit up blue for the month of September to raise awareness. To those who live and fight this battle, know that you are not alone, and it's my hope that together, we can promote, educate, and find a cure for this terrible disease. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Manning. Mr. Speaker, over the course of the summer, I had the pleasure of speaking to thousands of constituents. One such group was the Nicaraguan community whom I had the pleasure of meeting with recently. The situation in Nicaragua has continued to deteriorate over the past months, and the Ortega regime continued to resort to violent oppression of the Nicaraguans' rights. Enforced disappearances, assaults, and even murder are tragically being employed to prevent people from protesting. Statesmen and condemnation from the international community have done a little, and then uh, has frustrated many of my Nicaraguan constituents. That's why I was happy to sponsor their petition E1804, calling on the government to sanction members of the Ortega regime with Canada Magnitsky Act. I encourage all Canadians to support this important petition and concrete steps to take and the tragic events in Nicaragua. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Orleans. Merci, Monsieur. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Today, September 25, is Franco-Ontarian Day. For those in the House who might not know it, Franco-Ontarians are Canadians who live in Ontario and speak in French. Today is a day to celebrate the Francophone community and its history, which goes back to over 400 years. It's also a day to reflect on our past. At the start of the 20th century, Franco-Ontarians were unable to maintain French in schools following the adoption of Regulation 17, which imposed English as the only teaching language in Ontario schools. But thankfully, Franco-Ontarians protested and then created their own school system to help keep their communities whole. Today, our Franco-Ontarian identity is dynamic and strong. Thanks to those who speak French. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Nickel Belt. Mr. Speaker, today I'd like to share some excellent news with you about the success of Franco Cité High School, which I attended. Applicants from Canada and the U.S. and were selected as the recipients of the Rydell 18 and 18 Smarter Football Program. The school was offered congratulations from arguably one of the NFL's greatest quarterbacks, Mr. Preston Manning. Manning and Ambassador. 
Mr. Manning is an ambassador for his sport, and he personally sent a video congratulating the school for winning this grant. Through this movement that recognizes and rewards teams for implementing smarter tactics on and off the field. I wish to congratulate the faculty, the students at Falaco State. J'aimerais de parler tout le monde ici. Please join me, everyone, in wishing an excellent school year and a successful sports season at Franco City. Go Patriots, go! Happy Franco-Ontarian Day! Well, the Honourable Member for Dauphin Swan River Nipawa. Mr. Speaker, on the evening of August 29th, RCMP Corporal Graham Kingdon was shot while responding with his partner to a reported break and enter at a rural property near Onano, Manitoba. Corporal Kingdon was transported by ambulance and then in a STARS helicopter to receive treatment in Winnipeg. Fortunately, the gunshot wound was not life-threatening and he is now back at home with his family. Many people deserve recognition for their work that day. The emergency medical responders, STARS Air Ambulance, the Riding Mountain National Park Wardens, the Rural Municipality of Harrison Park and the RCMP communications team. I also want to acknowledge the strength of local residents who rallied in support of their community during this conducted a dangerous manhunt through the night, resulting in the arrest of four suspects. I am grateful for the bravery of each of them, along with Corporal Graham Kingdon and all the other officers of my constituency, and I want to thank them for all they do to protect our communities. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. Yeah. The Honourable Member for Fredericton. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to offer my sincere thanks to all New Brunswickers who played a role in the success of the election which happened last night. To all candidates, congratulations for working so hard over the last few weeks. Thank you to all the officials who also did their part at the polling stations. Thank you for being there for our candidates and for the political parties. Lastly, I would like to thank all of the volunteers who worked tirelessly over the last few weeks. Volunteers help our candidates so much during an election campaign. Volunteers donate their hard-earned dollars. Volunteers make sandwiches and cook dinner. Volunteers provide energy and support for candidates who are tired as they knock on doors and make phone calls. Everybody in this chamber, I know, appreciates the work of volunteers who support them on the campaign trail. To our volunteers, merci beaucoup. The Honourable Member for Whitby. Mr. Speaker, for this first Gender Equality Week, I decided to capture the thoughts of some young people on the benefits. Johnny Chavan, a fifth grader from Jack Minor, who happens to be my son, said Gender Equality Week allows us to ensure that all people are recognized for what they do for Canada and that people can be successful no matter their gender. Faye Johnstone, a fierce trans feminine and non-binary Twitter follower of mine, said that it is an opportunity to applaud the progress that we've made, but to be honest about surviving and thriving under the harsh realities of patriarchy, transphobia, and other forms of oppression, and to ensure that the voices and realities of gender-diverse and marginalized communities are centered in the fight for gender equality. And lastly, Brianne Olu-Cole, a grade 6 female student at Captain Michael Vandenbos, said that this week is important so that society knows that no gender is superior to another and that we are all equal. Mr. Speaker, our young people get it. Happy Gender Equality. Week. The Honourable Member for Lethbridge. Mr. Speaker, this week we celebrate just that. We celebrate women's equality, and Conservatives are proud advocates for the equal, equal and fair treatment of women. As we celebrate this important week, however, we are confronted by a very grave atrocity that the Liberal government fails to acknowledge. The Prime Minister has signed off on giving veterans benefits to a man who viciously killed an off-duty police officer. Over and over again in question period, the Liberals continue to defend Chris Garnier, the killer, a man who brutally murdered off-duty police officer Catherine Campbell. During Women's Equality Week, we should be celebrating women like Catherine. Catherine was a young woman who overcame barriers in order to work in a male-dominated field of law enforcement. Catherine served her community as a volunteer firefighter for 10 years, and Catherine served as a role model to many, many people, women and men alike. In defence of equality, Conservatives will continue to call upon this government to respect the memory of Catherine Campbell. 
We ask the government to reverse its decision to grant veterans funding to the man who brutally took her life. The Honourable Member for Bonavista Buren Trinity. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to honour Mr. Indy Lake, a resident of Fortune in my riding. Mr. Lake is a decorated Second World War veteran who celebrated his 100th birthday on August 12th. Mr. Lake was in active military service for five years from 1940 to 1945. After two years of service in the Mediterranean Sea, he went home for leave. On his journey home, Mr. Lake was aboard the SS Caribou as it was attacked by a German U-boat and sank on October 14, 1942 in the Capitol Strait. Mr. Lake went on to serve in the invasions of Sicily, Salerno, Anzio, and no Normandy, and at the end of the war in Europe, he volunteered to go to the Pacific, but his request was not granted, and he was told, we think you've had enough. Mr. Speaker, on behalf of all of the residents of Bonavista Buren Trinity and indeed all Canadians. I want to thank Mr. Hindley Lake for his service and wish him all the best in his 100th year. The Honourable Member for Windsor West. In May of 2016, I warned the government to protect Canadians from CRA telephone scams from India. Their inaction is obscene. The government has over 60,000 recorded complaints around fraudulent calls from criminals impersonating CRA agents, demanding payment, threatening legal action, even incarceration. Millions of dollars have been scammed, but still nothing from the Liberals. They never do the hard work. While the Prime Minister was in India, he was more concerned about the optics of his junket and his dress rather than doing anything to protect Canadians from fraudsters and organized criminals stealing money from Canadians. Why did he not raise this issue? The Minister of Public Safety's indifference and incompetence with respect to Canadians' privacy in protecting these victims of scams is nothing short of scandalous and out of touch. I encourage all Canadians to call the Minister at 613-947-1153 to do something about this. The Honourable Member for Milton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to congratulate Blaine Hicks and the Progressive Conservative Party of New Brunswick on winning 22 seats, the most seats in the legislature last night. I, like other Canadians, were watching this election closely, and we see this as proof that New Brunswickers stand with Saskatchewan, Ontario, Manitoba, and would fight against the Prime Minister's carbon tax. that the people of New Brunswick will not be bystanders. They used their voice and chose to fight back against an unfair tax. Blaine Higgs and his entire Progressive Conservative team worked tirelessly over the campaign trail, putting New Brunswickers first and committed to meet their environmental obligations without digging deeper in the taxpayers' pocket. We look forward to working with them. The Honourable Member for Glengarry Prescott Russell. Mr. President, Mr. Speaker, September 25 is Franco Ontarian Day. Today, I had the opportunity to celebrate this great day with the Minister for Canadian Heritage and Multiculturalism at the, the Lescale High School in Rockland. Our ancestors would be proud of the sense of initiative and create and creativity which our school boards have shown in organizing the celebrations we've come a long way since regulation 17 since the creation of our school boards and since the fight to save Montfort hospital but we must remain resilient thank you to organizations like lecfo prescott russell the assemblée de la francophonie de l'ontario the calax and all of our partners who are doing essential work to not only preserve but also promote franco-ontarian communities Mr. Speaker, today I saw that the students at Lescale and in Ontario are ready and willing to take up the torch and lead the way towards a better future. Happy Franco-Ontarian Day to all. Oral questions. Questions orales. L'honorable chef de l'opposition. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. 
Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister's record on Veterans Affairs is abysmal. First, he forced veterans back to court in order to prevent having to pay them the benefits he promised. Then he left over $300 million in funding unspent on veteran services. And the backlog for veterans waiting to have their benefits process has risen by over 50 percent. But to add disgusting insult to that injury, the department is now using veterans' money on a convicted killer. Will the Prime Minister finally do the right thing and cancel these benefits for this the Honourable Minister of Veterans Affairs. Mr. Speaker, the health and well-being of our veterans is our top priority. I have reviewed the department's findings on this issue, and I am directing them to ensure the services received by a family member of a veteran are related to the veteran's service and where they are not, that the case be reviewed by a senior official. I am directing the department to immediately address its policy in providing treatment to family members under extenuating circumstances such as conviction of such a serious crime. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition, order. Mr. Speaker, the summer has passed, and after the Prime Minister guaranteed that the Trans Mountain Project would be started this summer, the thousands of out-of-work energy workers in this country have been left disappointed. We are now nearing the end of September. The Prime Minister promised that he would introduce legislation that would allow the Trans Mountain Project to be built. Will he introduce that legislation today? Mr. Speaker, what we heard yesterday from the leader of the official opposition was the failed policies of the hardware. The, the decade of failure was completely demonstrated yesterday when the official leader, leader of the official opposition showed complete disregard for the courts, complete disregard for the environment, and complete disregard for the consultation with the indigenous peoples. We are focused on getting this project back on track in the right way. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Order. The Honourable Opposition House Leader, of course, knows that her side has other turns, and so I'd ask her to wait for those and allow those who have the floor to speak and not be interrupted. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, the Minister well knows that the previous Conservative government saw four major pipeline approvals right. yep. approved and built under our government. But that wasn't the question. The question was, the Prime Minister guaranteed that this project would be started this summer. He also promised legislation that would provide a path for the Trans Mountain project to be built. It's now the end of September. Will the Prime Minister introduce that legislation today? Mr. Speaker, let's talk about the failed record of the Harper government to build a single pipeline to expand our global non-U.S. market. When they got in office in 2006, 99 percent of Alberta's oil was sold to the United States. When they left office in 2015, 99 percent of Alberta's oil was sold to the United States. We are focused on expanding our global market so we can create more jobs for the middle class, so we can get a proper price for Alberta's oil and continue to grow our economy in the way that we're The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. Mr. Speaker, on this side of the House, we Conservatives think Trans Mountain is essential and critical for the economy of all Canadians. But what is the Liberal government doing? After having sent $4.5 billion to Houston, they seem pleased with the postponement. What a Liberal failure. Can the Liberal government give us a date? When will work begin on Trans Mountain? Mr. Speaker, we understand that uh, the investment in the Trans Mountain uh, Pipeline project is in the national interest. That's why we are moving forward on this project in the right way, making sure that we are respecting in our obligations to meaningfully consult with indi indigenous peoples, at the same time having a uh, plan in place that allows us to protect the coastal communities, allows us to take action on the impact of the tanker traffic on the marine, uh, marine environment. We are committed to getting this project in the right way, Speaker. Deputy Louis Saint Laurent. The Honourable Member, Mr. Speaker, you'll have noticed 
that they can't tell us when the government will begin work on Trans Mountain. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister does not believe in Canada's energy potential. Now, he's, I think that the Prime Minister wants to see it eliminated. On this side, we have a plan, constructive and realistic plan. Does the government agree that we should bring in legislation, make this a national project? Mr. Speaker, for, for years, the previous government cut corners. They disregarded the environmental regulations and they ignored the indigenous people's right to be meaningfully consulted. And the result, not a single kilometer of pipeline built to get our resources to the global market. We are going to do things differently. We're going to consult with the indigenous peoples. We're going to make sure that we're taking action on protecting coastal communities, that we're taking action to ensure that the impact of the tanker traffic is meaningfully and properly considered. That's the Honorable Deputy de Remus-Kinesh. The Honorable Member for Remus-Kinesh, Timiskwata, Le Basque. That's a message being delivered to this government from the Union of British Columbia Indian Chiefs. They're calling on this Prime Minister to cancel his directive to redo his failed process on the Trans Mountain expansion. Doubling down on getting through the same flawed process to attain the court's bare minimum standard does not qualify as a meaningful consultation. Do Liberals understand that it takes much, much more to meaningfully consult with Indigenous peoples? Minister of Natural Resources. Mr. Speaker, uh, our government understands that no relationship is more important to our government than the relationship with indigenous peoples. We have committed to moving forward on this project in the right way. We have instructed the NEB to undertake the review that was denied by the previous Conservative government to factor in the, uh, the, the, the impact of the marine shipping on the marine environment. We will be announcing the rest of the plan very, very shortly, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member. Mr. Speaker, this rhetoric, as we just heard with the Minister, and then there are facts. We have two parties who want whatever the cost to force the expansion of Trans Mountain. They want to do the absolute minimum to respond to the Federal Court of Appeal, and worse, they may want to do away outright with consultations with Indigenous communities. They, sh they have to hold consultations, meaningful consultations, with the people who will have to live with this pipeline and the risks of leaks. Do they not understand that Indigenous people have rights on their land? Speaker, the, uh, the, the issue that the member of the uh, NDP is not focused on is that we need to make sure that we are expanding our global market for our natural resources. That is why it is very important that we do it in the right way, which includes meaningful consultation exactly with the right. indigenous communities, at the same time making sure that we are protecting our environment, that we are looking after the issues that court has identified. It is very important that we reduce our dependency on the single customer that we have, which is the United States, to sell our oil resources. The Honourable Member for ABTB, G uh, James Bay. Will be done uh, no matter what. And his minister adds that, uh, that, this, uh, that Canada will not be able to accommodate all Indigenous concerns. What that means is that they have decided to willfully violate their constitutional duties and obligations. Mr. Minister, Mr. Speaker, sounds like a most important relationship, doesn't it? Why doesn't the Prime Minister just say the truth and tell the Indigenous peoples that he doesn't give a fuck about their rights? Honourable member for Abitibi Bay James Nunavik EU is an experienced member and knows that that is unparliamentary language, and I'd ask him to withdraw the word and apologize. Mr. Mr. Speaker, what is happening is so insulting that it just it makes me so angry, but I do withdraw the word. I sincerely thank the honourable member.
Mr. Speaker, we have a tremendous amount of respect for uh, Indigenous Canadians from coast to coast to coast. Since being appointed to this office, uh, this, uh, this uh, department, I have been uh, reaching out to Indigenous leaders before even the court's decision, and I will continue to do so. As I said earlier, Mr. Speaker, there is no relationship more important to our government than the relationship with Indigenous peoples, and we're going to move forward on this project in the right way, making sure that we're meeting our uh, constitutional obligations to meaningfully concert with Indigenous. The Honourable Member for North Island, Powell River. Well, Mr. Speaker, this certainly doesn't feel like respect to many Indigenous communities across this country. The Union of BC Chiefs are calling for this Prime Minister to accept the federal court's decision once and for all and cancel the expansion of this disastrous Trans Mountain Pipeline and Taker project. How can this government stand in this house, in this country, and say that this is their most important relationship? Mr. Speaker, like, uh, like all other Canadians, there are diverse views among Indigenous peoples on the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion, uh, expansion. We respect that and we value that. There are a number of First Nations communities that have assigned benefit agreements because they see the value of this project, and there are other communities that are against it. And we will work with all of them because we understand that try to build a consensus is something that is important for a project such as this to move forward in the right way. Bravo. Bravo. Member for Milton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, Christopher Garnier was convicted of second-degree murder when he murdered a female police officer by the name of Catherine Campbell. Apparently, he now suffers from PTSD as a result of committing the murder. Veterans Affairs Canada is paying for services for Mr. Garnier. The murderer has been put to the front of the line while our men and women who served our country are not receiving benefits because they're still waiting. Mr. Speaker, what I'd like to know from the Minister of Veterans Affairs, will he do the right thing and cancel the benefits that Mr. Garnier is receiving? Minister of Veterans Affairs. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, it is moments like this that our commitment to our veterans is tested. We can not discuss the treatment of this individual without discussing the treatment of the father, without discussing the treatment of the veteran. And I stand before this House as someone who will not infringe upon the privacy of that veteran. We all know because of their track record what that side of the House would have us do because they did it before. They played with veterans' health records like they were playing cards. We will not. Even in this most trying of times, we will not. Order. The Honourable Member for Milton. Well, Mr. Speaker, what can I say? On August 31st, this minister, the Minister of Veterans Affairs, indicated that he was going to ask his department what had happened and get to the bottom of it. He told a newspaper report that. It's taken 25 days to get to the bottom of this. Now, Minister, I, I, Speaker, I served as a minister. And as a result, I know that you can get this information in 24 hours, not in 24 days. Mr. Speaker, I want to know this very specifically. Will people who are receiving benefits that have committed heinous crimes like murder have their payments taken away retroactively? The Honourable Minister of Veterans Affairs. Mr. Speaker, once again, I cannot discuss this case. And I cannot discuss this case without infringing upon the privacy of a veteran. I will not play games with veterans. I will not, even in this most trying and egregious of times, when the son of a veteran is a convicted cop killer, I will not turn my back on that veteran. And for any veteran who is watching this debate, let them know this government, even under the most extenuating of circumstances, will not turn their back on veterans. Order. Order a Deputy de Richmond. The Honourable Member for Richmond Athabasca. Mr. Speaker, in 2017, Christopher Garnier was found guilty 
of the second degree murder of Constable Catherine Campbell. This man is receiving benefits from the Department of Veterans Affairs while he is in prison and has never served in the Canadian Armed Forces. This is a disgrace for our country, for our veterans, and for the memory of Constable Catherine Campbell. Can the Prime Minister finally shoulder his responsibilities and put an end to this injustice immediately? The Honourable Minister. The extenuating of circumstances. We will stand by our veterans. We have shown that time and again. We have shown that time and again, Mr. Speaker, when we have increased benefits for, for veterans, we have increased services. We have reopened offices. We have increased staff. We have given them back their ID card, Mr. Speaker. We will continue to show respect for veterans, even in this most trying of times. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Richemont Artabasca. Mr. Speaker, the facts are simple. The Minister of Veterans Affairs is presently paying for the treatment of Christopher Garnier, even though he killed Constable Catherine Campbell. This is quite simply outrageous. The Campbell family is angry, veterans are angry, Canadians are angry, we are angry. This just doesn't make sense. The Prime Minister has the power to put an end to this injustice. And do it. what is he waiting for? The Honourable Minister. Many people in this House have expressed their outrage. Canadians have expressed their outrage. But our outrage will not factor into the treatment of veterans. Our outrage should not factor into justice and into laws. We will stand by our veterans, Mr. Speaker, even now, even in the most extenuating of circumstances. We will stand by our veterans. The Honourable Order. The Honourable Member for Brantford Brant. Today, by the order. Minister, Sorry. are obvious. Order, 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 order. The member started a little early. I'm going to ask him to start again. The Honourable Member for Brantford Brant. Mr. Speaker. Today, the comments in the debate around the Chris Garnier case shows a clear lack of leadership and the ability that this minister has and the Prime Minister to intervene and stop this outrageous situation where this murderer is receiving veterans' benefits. This is not a theatre today for this minister to pat himself on the back. This is a place where we ask him to solve this now or resign. Minister of Veterans Affairs. Order. Mr. Speaker, for 10 years, this House was used as a place where people on that side of that House cut benefits, cut services, closed offices, cut staff, took away an ID card from veterans. We will continue to stand by our veterans. We will continue to rebuild a, a department that was near. The Honourable Member for Brantford Brant. Mr. Speaker, this minister continues to defend the indefensible on this Garnier case. Catherine Campbell was brutally murdered, put into a compost bin and dumped under a bridge. This is a one-off situation. This is a mistake by Veterans Affairs to make this decision in the first place. Yet he and the Prime Minister will not even speak to the issue of addressing it as Canadians are demanding, and as especially veterans. If he's not willing to do this, it's his place in this House to resign his position. Honourable Minister of Veterans Affairs. Mr. Speaker, we cannot discuss the details of this case without discussing the case of the veteran. And we will not, we will not, 
I will not discuss the case of this veteran. We will stand by the veterans in this country, even in the most extenuating of circumstances, even in the most egregious of circumstances, even in these circumstances where the son of a veteran is convicted of killing a police officer. Even now, we will stand with that veteran, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Rosemont La Petite Patrie. When they bought Trans Mountain, the Liberals also acquired the Puget Sound Line, which sends Bitumen to the U.S. And the state of Washington's Environment Department is worried. They're criticizing the serious inadequacies of the plan in, in case of a spill. They want, they want to know what will happen if this heavy bitumen uh, hits the sea and threatens species such as salmon and killer whales. Even the Americans are afraid of the Liberals when it comes to the environment. Mr. Mr. Speaker, environmental sustainability is at the heart of everything that this government does. The decision with respect to the Trans Mountain Pipeline originally was based on an assessment with respect to the environmental considerations. We've done enormous amount of work with respect to issues associated with diluted bitumen and spills potentially in the water. We've done an enormous amount of work on ensuring that we are protecting the coast, preventing spills. We've done an enormous amount of work on recovering the killer whales and working to ensure that the measures that are being put into place will more than mitigate the impact of the ta excess tanker traffic. Mr. Speaker, this project is being done in an environmentally responsible way that advances Canada's economic interests. Honourable Member for Skin Valley. You know, when the Liberals bought a 65-year-old leaky pipeline, most Canadians thought they definitely would have a super-duper cleanup plan in case of an oil spill. Well, apparently not. Washington State is raising the alarm, saying the Liberals' emergency plan has, quote, major deficiencies in critical areas to protect salmon and whales. It's like the Liberals went out and bought a 72 Pinto, no airbags, no seatbelts, and said, kids, hop in, let's go for a ride. No parent would do this. So why did the Liberals burden Canadians? with this old pipeline, didn't even bother to keep the receipt for four and a half billion dollars, and don't have an emergency plan to clean up a spill. Yeah, yeah. Honourable Minister of Fisheries. Mr. Speaker, uh, some in the House like to, to engage in theatre, we, we like to engage in facts. So we have done the work to ensure that the process can be handled in an environmentally sustainable way. The Ocean's Protection Plan is addressing concerns with respect to spill prevention, concerns with respect to spill response. We've released three peer-reviewed studies with respect to the impacts on marine environment. We've done an enormous amount to ensure that we're protecting the marine environment, killer whales and other species. This project is being done, has, has been constructed in an environmentally responsible way. We are balancing the economy and the environment, ensuring that both... Order. Order. The Honourable Member for Longueuil. I will ask the Honourable Member for Longueuil, Assad Joubert, to remain calm. Christopher Garnier brutally murdered an off duty police officer by the name of Catherine Campbell. During sentencing, the judge stated that Mr. Garnier punched her in the face, he broke her nose, he strangled her to death, and he treated her remains like garbage. Direct quote. The Prime Minister claims to be a champion of women's rights. Why then has he signed off on granting veterans benefits to a man who never, ever, ever served a single day in the Canadian Armed Forces, but killed an off-duty female police officer? Why is that okay? Honourable Minister of Veterans Affairs. Mr. Speaker, my heart goes out to the family of Constable Campbell. They should not have to endure this. They should not have to endure this case being brought out for political expediency. We should, they should not have to endure it, Mr. Speaker. We will continue to stand by our veterans. We will continue to stand by our veterans as we have every day in this House for the past three years, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Chicoutimi Le Fior. Mr. Speaker, for two weeks now, we've been interrogating the government about the case of Chris Garnier, a criminal who is receiving assistance reserved for courageous veterans. All we see is liberal inaction. The Conservatives showed leadership when serial killer Clifford Olson was getting his old age security. We stopped 
that. We put an end to it. When will the minister shoulder his responsibilities and when will he intervene personally with respect to Christopher Gauvier? Mr. Speaker, once again, even in the face of a political expediency, we will stand by our veterans. We have spent $10 billion in three years on our veterans and their families. We have increased benefits. We have increased services. We have increased staff. We have reopened offices. And we've given them back their ID cards, Mr. Speaker. Even in the most trying of circumstances, we will stand with our veterans. Order. We have a member for Chilliwack Hope. Mr. Speaker, they may stand beside Chris Garnier, but we will stand with the victim and her family in this case, Mr. Speaker. This gentleman, Chris Garnier, was 30 years old. He never served a single day in the Canadian Forces, yet this Liberal government is using veterans' benefits to pay for his PTSD therapy. PTSD he developed because of how he killed the victim. The Prime Minister has had a month to end this outrage, so when will he finally do the right thing and guarantee that not a single cent more will go to Chris Garnier? Honourable Minister of Veterans Affairs. Mr. Speaker, those on the other side of the House had 10 years to do better by our veterans, and I wish we could only accuse them of inaction. That might have been easier. But it wasn't inaction, Mr. Speaker. It was I'd ask the Honourable Member for Bruce Gray Owen Sound not to keep interrupting. In spite of how strongly people feel on these subjects, we have to have debate that allows one side to speak at a time and show respect for this institution and this place. The Honourable Minister of Veterans Affairs has 20 seconds left. In 10 years, they stood time and again, time and again in 10 years, and they cut benefits. They cut services. They closed offices. They cut staff. And they even took away their ID card. I wish we could accuse them of inaction, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Chilliwack Hope. Order. We are not talking about a veteran. We're talking about a 30-year-old murderer who never spent a day in uniform. The Prime Minister could have ended these payments with the stroke of a pen. Instead, he endorsed them. But we know where the Prime Minister stands, but tonight every member of this House will be given an opportunity to tell Canadians where they stand. Will a single Liberal Member of Parliament stand up for what's right, or will they endorse the Prime Minister's plan of paying veterans' benefits to convicted murderers? Honourable Minister of Veterans Affairs. Indeed, Mr. Speaker, one of the people at the centre of this is a veteran. Is a veteran and that veteran's family. And even in this, even in the most extenuating of circumstances, we will stand with that veteran. As we have stood with veterans every day when we have voted for increases to veterans' benefits, to veterans' services, when we have reopened offices, when we have increased staff, Every time we vote on the side of veterans, even in the most trying of circumstances, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Member for Essex. Canadians expect the Liberals to secure a new NAFTA that defends our jobs in key sectors. A new poll shows Canadians also want a deal that defends access to affordable prescription medications. But according to reports, negotiators are considering U.S. proposals that will lead to higher drug costs for Canadians and for public drug plans. I think of my constituent Cheryl. Every year she must pay thousands of dollars out of pocket for heart and blood pressure medications. Will the Prime Minister commit that NAFTA 2.0 will not raise the cost of drugs for Canadians? Honourable Parliamentary Secretary for Canada U.S. Relations. So how proud Canadians are of our public health care system and we're going to defend it. We also know that the affordability of and access to prescription drugs remains an important issue for all Canadians. We will continue to work with the provinces, territories and our partners to lower drug prices and provide timely access to medicines. This is an important issue for our government and we have said such during the NAFTA discussions. Our government will always stand up for Canadians, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Member for Victoria. Our Charter of Rights and Freedoms, Canadian courts have given women the right to choose medical assistance in dying, LGBTQ2 rights, collective bargaining rights and more. And while the notwithstanding clause is part of the Charter, so far it's always been used sparingly, mm -hmm. maybe no longer. Canadians are 
telling me just how disappointed they are that the Liberals refuse to even study the use of the clause, which lets legislatures, of course, override their rights. So what we want to know is this. Why won't the Liberals even allow a study of this notwithstanding clause so we can better protect the charter rights of Canadians? The Honourable Minister of Intergovernmental and Northern Affairs. Mr. Speaker, our government has been very clear. We think the notwithstanding clause should only be considered in the most exceptional of circumstances. We think that the government's responsibility is to stand up for the charter rights of Canadians. That's something that this government, Mr. Speaker, will always do. We've expressed publicly our dismay when the government of Ontario was considering using the notwithstanding clause. Our Toronto caucus stood firmly against that position and will continue to defend, Mr. Speaker, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Honorable député de Nickel Belt. The Honourable Member for Nickel Belt. Mr. Speaker, on Franco-Ontarian Day, we join the Francophones and Francophiles to celebrate culture, language and tradition, the Franco-Ontarians. Can the Minister for Tourism, Francophones, who went to a school in Orleans to make an announcement, could she inform this House of the good news that she shared during that visit? The Honourable Minister. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to uh, congratulate the Honourable Member for Nickel Belt, and I join my voice to his in uh, celebrating in green and white a Franco-Ontarian Day. Today, I was at Notre Dame des Champs School, and I met with 310 students to announce $7.5 million for the 700 Francophone schools and 300 Anglophone minority schools in Canada so that students have access to cultural activities. As a government, we believe in our official languages and we believe in our children. Member for Halliburton, Florida, Lake Scott. Speaker, after a summer of failures, this Prime Minister still has no plan to get Trans Mountain built. Conservatives unveiled their plan. Complete Indigenous consultation immediately. Enact emergency legislation. Request a stay and appeal the federal court ruling. And pass Bill S-245, clarifying the pipeline is under federal jurisdiction. We have a plan while Liberals just delay. Will the government adopt the Conservative plan and bring jobs and investment back to Canada? Yeah. Well, Minister of Natural Resources. Mr. Speaker, after a decade of failure, the official opposition is still repeating the same things that they have done for a decade. Complete disregard for the federal court's ruling. Complete disregard taking action on the environmental sustainability, including the protection of the coastal communities. Complete disregard for engaging indigenous peoples in a meaningful dialogue. We are going to move forward on this project in the right way, responding to the issues that are relevant to this decision. And we'll be announcing that plan very shortly. Thank you. Member for Kamloops, Thompson, Caribou. Uh, Mr. Speaker, Trans Mountain Pipeline is critical for the 43 First Nations with benefit agreements and many others. Yesterday, the leader of Canada's Conservatives announced a comprehensive plan that makes use of every tool in the toolbox to get this pipeline built. This includes meaningful consultation with Indigenous peoples, which they didn't do when they just simply sent a note-taker. When will the Liberals show some leadership and announce a real plan instead of dithering along like they have been? Well, the member for natural resources. Mr. Speaker, our government understands that uh, getting our natural resources to global market, non-U.S. market, is very important to create jobs and, uh, and grow our economy. But we're going to do that in a responsible way. And that responsible way is to making sure that we are respecting the environment, that we're taking action on protecting our, our marine uh, environment, at the same time in a meaningful consultation with the indigenous peoples. We recognize there is diversity of opinion among Indigenous peoples, and we respect that, and we will continue to work with all of them. Thank you. Honourable Member for Foothills. Conservatives unveiled our plan to build the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion to the public yesterday. Our plan addresses all of the risks to build this pipeline. That's right. The Liberals have a choice. They can continue to delay this project and, in doing so, continue their record of failure. Or they can follow the Conservatives' plan, use every tool available to them right. to get this pipeline built. 
When will the minister start doing his job, get Canadians back to work, and Do get the, the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion project underway? Yeah. 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 Mr. Speaker, what they announced yesterday was the reputation of a decade of failure, which is to ignore the direction from the courts, ignore and disregard the courts, disregard the environment, and disregard the consultation with Indigenous peoples. If they followed the proper procedure, Mr. Speaker, they might have put, probably would have built a pipeline to get our resources to the global market. 99% of our oil is sold to one customer, which is the United States, Mr. Speaker. We need to diversify our natural resources market, and we're going to do that in a proper right way. Honourable Member for Foothills. Pipeline companies invest billions of dollars in consultants and environmental assessments, and that is just to table their proposal. They made these investments under Conservative governments because they knew Conservatives would champion That's these right. projects. But under the Liberal watch, not one single major Great piece zero. of oil infrastructure has been proposed, and that is in three years. When will the Liberals understand that their failed policies are not getting one inch of pipeline built? When will they do their job, get the Trans Mountain do Pipeline expansion right moving? On. Right on. Right on. Right on. Right on. Mr. Speaker, I think uh, it will be beneficial for the member to understand that the decision made in 2014 to exclude from the NEB the review of the marine shipping and its impact on the environment was done under the Harper government. Oh. And the court has been very clear that that was the wrong decision to make. We are going to correct that. We have directed the NAB to consider the impact of the marine shipping on the marine environment, and we're going to move forward on this project in the right way because we understand that creating jobs and protecting the environment go ahead. Honourable Member for Vancouver Kingsway. Thousands of Canadian families have lost loved ones to an overdose epidemic this government has failed to stem. Health professionals, Canada's chief public health officer, the president of the Canadian Medical Association, big city mayors and police chiefs all want to decriminalize and regulate substance use to save lives. Instead, today we see the Prime Minister sign on to the failed war on drugs approach demanded by Donald Trump. Wow. Are the Liberals truly so desperate for a new NAFTA that they are prepared to put Canadians' at lives at risk to get it? Minister of Health. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, protecting the health and safety of Canadians is my top priority. We are in a national public health crisis when it comes to the opioid epidemic, and we've seen the tragic numbers that were released last week. The numbers are more than numbers, Mr. Speaker. These are lives of Canadians. Substance abuse is an, inter is an international problem, and the global call for action will help us move forward. 130 countries have signed on to the declaration, and we certainly want to be a part of that conversation. If we're not around the table, Mr. Speaker, we certainly won't be able to affect change. The Honourable Member for Laurier Sainte Marie. Mr. Speaker, Today, to the surprise of the international community and experts, the Liberals endorsed the devastating war on drugs put forth by President Trump. Trump told the UN would no longer be supporting multilateralism, would be cutting international assistance, and would be opposing the International Criminal Court. He doesn't even want to promote human rights anymore. So instead of trying to please the Trump administration, Will the Liberals take a stand and condemn the American President's dangerous rhetoric? The Honourable Minister, protecting the health of Canadians is my top priority as Minister of Health. We are currently in an opioid crisis, a national crisis, and we are facing it. Last week, the figures came out and they were tragic. They're not just figures, but we're talking about lives that are being lost in this country. The use of illicit substance is a world issue, a global issue, and a call. We need to act globally. Countries signed the declaration, and we acknowledge that, that uh, there are different positions. It, it's impossible to make change without being around the table. Oh. 
Speaker, while the Minister for Veterans Affairs has been doubling down on his ridiculous answers to our questions, his department has gone out during question period and has stated that going forward, Veterans Affairs will no longer provide treatment to any veteran's family member who is in federal or provincial prison. But the question is this, because the Minister has stood here for days, for 29 days, and not answered this question, will he rescind the benefits to Chris Garnier? Of the Minister of Veterans Affairs. Mr. Speaker, I cannot talk about this case without talking about the case of the veteran. And I will stand by that veteran. I will stand by that veteran even under the most excruciating of circumstances, where, where a family member has committed such an egregious crime. Even then, this government will stand by them. Thank you. Calgary Nose Hill. Uh, okay, Mr. Speaker, so the Minister's department has gone forward and given the exact opposite answer. Yes. We're asking a very simple question here. They've said going forward Stand there will be no department. benefits to people who are in federal prison. He has to, like, he has to come up with an answer to this. <laughs> will he receive the benefits for a cop killer, Chris Garnier? Honourable Minister of Veterans Affairs. Mr. Speaker, we will stand by the veteran who is at the center of this case. We are, our support for that veteran is unwavering. Even now, even in the most extenuating of circumstances, we will stand by that veteran. The Honourable Member, 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 he took her daughter away. He's receiving money from Veterans Affairs when he didn't serve a single minute, Mr. Speaker. Will the government rescind those payments, yes or no? The Honourable Minister of Veterans Affairs. In the 40-plus town halls that I have done across this country with veterans and their families, I can tell you, I know the cost of 10 years of not just neglect but malice towards our veterans and their families. And I wish we had seen more of that indignation that we see today over the 10 years that these people had to do right by our veterans and our families. Honourable Member for Etobicoke Centre. Mr. Speaker, our government is proud to have a feminist foreign policy. Gender equality produces greater prosperity and a more peaceful and secure world. Yep. At the Women's Foreign Minister's meeting in Montreal, the, the Minister of Foreign Affairs reaffirmed Canada's international leadership in promoting women's empowerment, gender equality, peace, and security. Can the Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Foreign Affairs update the House on this important announcement? Good question. Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank the member for Etobicoke Centre for his tireless work on this issue. Our government knows that women are powerful agents for change and for peace. And we also know that when women are involved in the peace process, peace agreements tend to last longer. That's why the Minister of Global Affairs was proud to announce the creation of Ambassador for Women, Peace and Security. Women's empowerment is a crucial issue, and I hope that all of my colleagues in this House will join us in celebrating this important announcement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Belle Chasse et Chemin Lévy. Mr. Speaker, three times I've asked the Minister of Defence and the Prime Minister to fix the fiasco with the Bastion du Roi at the Citadel. We're talking about a possible collapse based on their experts. Now, architects have talked about the original stone. Why are they taking poor quality U.S. stone? This is contempt for Quebecers and for our Canadian heritage. Minister of National Defence. Speaker, we value the rich heritage of the Citadel in Quebec City. So let me be clear. We will repair the fort using original Citadel stones. In cases where damage to the original stone is too severe, a Quebec bidder has been contracted to, to ensure additional stones meet strict regulations. Oh. National Defence is doing its work to make sure this stone follows the requirements because we understand how important this is to Quebec City. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Nanaimo Lady Smith. The, cape, the pay gap between men and women is 32 per cent. It's even worse for women with disabilities, Indigenous and racialized women. Women are done waiting. We want economic justice now. 
But every day we hear heartbreaking stories about women in poverty with the same root cause, no pay equity. If Liberals were serious about gender equality, why are women still waiting for the proactive pay equity legislation they've been promised for 42 years? Honourable Minister of Employment. Mr. Speaker, I agree with the member opposite that equal pay for work of equal value is a human right, and that's why we're so proud as a government to be moving forward with proactive pay equity legislation. It's a key way that we are demonstrating our commitment to gender equality. It's a key way that we will attempt to close the gender <coughs> wage gap, and we are already working diligently. Consultations have been done, and we will be moving forward with pay equity legislation later this year. Thank you very much. The Honourable Member for Brampton North. Mr. Speaker, this week is National Coaches Week, a week to recognize coaches from coast to coast to coast and the incredible contributions to athletes, families and communities. I'd like to thank all coaches in my riding of Brampton North, including my son's soccer coach, for their dedication and countless hours of helping our youth and athletes learn, train and succeed. Merci de promouvoir les Thank you for promoting young athletes throughout their lives. Or tell this House how important coaches are to the communities in Canada. Excellent. The Honourable Minister. Thanks to my colleague from Brampton North for that question. Mr. Speaker, happy National Coaches Week. All over Canada, coaches give their time to help athletes and youth succeed in sport and in life. Coaches are supporters, motivators, and role models. They help athletes to dream, to set goals, believe in themselves, and to reach their full potential. Today, I ask all members of the House to join me and thank the coaches you know using the hashtag ThanksCoach. Honourable Member for Order, Order. The Honourable Member for Edmonton with Tasco in. Mr. Speaker, it's increasingly evident that the Liberal environment and energy policy is an unmitigated disaster. The Liberal carbon tax has been resoundingly rejected as just a tax on Canadian, Canadians that will have literally no impact on global emissions. And even with significant Canadian taxpayer dollars spent, there is a broad consensus that we will still not meet our greenhouse gas emissions commitments. So will the government commit, confirm today that despite all of their bluster, in fact, they will not in fact meet our Paris Agreement targets? Whoa. Well, Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Environment. Mr. Speaker, this government is confident it's going to meet its Paris Agreement targets. The Honourable Member is seemingly has not read the report from Stephen Harper's former Director of Policy that indicated that when we put a price on pollution, it's going to have a net economic benefit for middle-class Canadian families. Mr. Speaker, I invite the Honourable Member to get on board instead of taking money out of his constituents' pockets so he can make pollution free again. <laughs> The Honourable Member for La Pointe de Lille. Mr. Speaker, on Sunday, the Minister for Border Security claimed that the vast majority of the 35,000 irregular border crossers uh, have left Canada. Finally, he admitted that it's about 1%. Is there. Well, in fact, the problem there is that those people are in limbo because their files simply aren't being processed. Is there someone in the government who's aware of the situation? Is there someone who has a mandate to take action on migrants? The Honourable Minister of Intergovernmental Affairs. Mr. President, no Mr. Speaker, we believe that it's important to start with the facts. We make decisions as a government based on evidence and data shows that the number of interceptions at the border has decreased over last year. We believe, Mr. Speaker, that it's important for our government to respect Canadian law, to work with our partners, including the Quebec government and other partners, in order to respect our commitments, but also to ensure that uh, the safety of Canadians remains a priority, and that is exactly what we're doing. The Honourable Member for Biconcourt, Nicolas Sorel. Mr. Speaker, last April, the government promised Quebec a program to screen Emmets in the coming week. In May, they said, oh, we'd have to wait a few weeks. End of July, we're almost there, they said. But today, there's still no plan. 
no plan, and Quebec is still waiting for more than $100 million in compensation for social services expenditures incurred last year alone. So I'll repeat my colleague's question. Is there anyone who has a real mandate to do something on the migrant file? The Honourable Minister. President. Mr. Speaker, the answer is yes. My colleague, the Minister for a Border Security, and I have had conversations, very encouraging discussions with the Quebec government and other partners. We have acknowledge the government's obligation to compensate the cost of temporary housing for our partners, including for the Quebec government. I've had several discussions and conversations, very encouraging ones. Quebec has been a leading partner with our government, and we will continue to work with our partners. Silence. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The urgent warnings from climate scientists are increasingly punctuated by extreme weather events, whether forest fires, floods, hurricanes or tornadoes. But this government is prepared to spend far more on pipelines than on climate action. It's as though we really believe in reconciliation for Indigenous peoples, but first we need to build a few more residential schools. Will this government instruct the National Energy Board to include climate impacts of the pipeline we now own as it did for private sector Energy East? Secretary. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank the uh, honourable member from Sandwich Gulf Islands for the question. Uh, we were elected on a commitment to grow the economy and protect the environment at the same time. This means we're going to take steps to get our resources to new markets while we still take steps to protect our environment and meet our Paris Agreement commitments. I note in particular, Mr. Speaker, that we're moving forward with a price on pollution that will reduce emissions. We're investing in clean technology and we put $1.5 billion into our Oceans Protection Plan to protect our oceans and waterways. As a coastal MP in an area that the honourable member is very familiar with, this is a commitment we share and I look forward to continuing to partner with her to move forward. I would like to draw to the attention of honourable members the presence in the gallery of the recipients of the 2019 Inspire Awards. Barbara Todd Hager, Grand Chief Ronald Derrickson, Juju Mary Snowshoe, Dr. Vianne Timmons, Dr. Marilyn Cook, Diane Corbière, Peter Dinsdale, Brigitte Laquette, Billy Ray Belcourt, Kelly Fraser, James Lavallee, and Atawat Atkiturk. Orders of the day. Orders of the day, government orders, business of supply, resuming debate on the opposition motion regarding veterans standing in the name of Mr. McCollman.
Order. Order. I'd ask honorable colleagues uh, um, to take their uh, conversations outside, and I would include, of course, the honorable member for Cape Breton Council, who I know, I'm sure it's an important conversation, but I encourage them, uh, him to continue that uh, outside, although the honorable member for City of Victoria has some doubt about that, but that's, I'll let those two debate that later. Uh, the, uh, resuming debate, the honorable member for Kingston and the Islands. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, and it's uh, an honour to rise today in the House to uh, um, talk about this very important topic. Uh, um, you know, I, I think I, I first want to start my, my remarks by um, paying my uh, sympathy to uh, Constable Catherine Campbell. Um, you know, this was a heinous uh, uh, tragedy and uh, a crime that was committed upon her, um, and uh, I think that uh, it's fair to say that the nation um, feels for her family and uh, what they've had to endure over the past uh, um, over, over the past time since uh, her tragic death. Um, and I also want to take the opportunity, Mr. Speaker, to talk a little bit about uh, the military personnel uh, writ large. You know, I have the opportunity to to serve uh, um, the constituents of Kingston and the island, and in that we have uh, a military base. Um, and I have, I've, I've been surrounded by military uh, personnel my whole life, and I've had the opportunity to uh, in, engage with them from time to time. But I would say it wasn't until I was, uh, became a member of the Defence Committee when serving in this House that I really gained an appreciation as to why our military personnel throughout the world um, have the in, in, um, incredible reputation that they do. And if you've had the opportunity to engage with our, our military in various parts of the world, you will see that they um, deserve and uh, they command a certain level of respect from others that they are engaging with. I think uh, quite often we tend to think that it's the um, uh, politicians and the policies that we make and that we've made throughout the years that have given Canada this um, great uh, reputation of being uh, peacekeepers and peace builders throughout the world. But in fact, it's our military folks um, who have been um, instrumental in um, really extending uh, the Canadian way to others and really imparting upon people what it means to be Canadian. and. Um, the values that we stand for. It's our military personnel that uh, really give us the distinction of, of, uh, of what we've come to be so pr proud of, and that's uh, um, the peacekeeping abilities. You know, us politicians will come and go, Mr. Speaker, um, but it's our military personnel who last throughout generations in various different parts of the world that truly um, give Canada the amazing name that, that we do have. The uh, motion that we're debating today, um, Mr. Speaker, um, you know, I think is very timely, and I'm glad to be able to stand and speak to it because we have the opportunity here to speak specifically um, to, uh, you know, where we've come uh, as, a, as a government uh, on our, the veterans file, where we were before that, and what we plan to see into the future. And I guess I preface my comments on that by saying that there is, in my opinion, uh, never enough that we can do for our veterans. Our veterans have given us the incredible quality of life uh, that we've uh, come to enjoy, um, the ability to sit in this house and have these debates, um, and, uh, and it's because of them and because of, uh, of their, their willingness to, to go into other parts of the world and to give us this uh, incredible uh, um, opportunity that we are here today and that we uh, have the amazing quality of life that we do. Um, and, I, and I should say, Mr. Speaker, uh, you caught me off guard when I jumped up there to speak, but uh, I will be splitting my time today with the uh, member from Winnipeg North. Um, the, uh, you know, what I'd like to, uh, to, to talk about, Mr. Speaker, is, is you know, where we were with our veterans over 10 years uh, um, with uh, the Conservatives and what they were actually able to do to the Veterans Affairs, affairs System um, writ large and how we saw um, diminishing services and supports for vets uh, throughout the years. So let's, uh, you know, start to, um, um, in, in terms of, uh, of, of where the file, a lot of the files have come. So for example, Mr. Speaker, um, the reality is over 10 years the Conservatives uh, looked at the Veterans Affairs Department as a place to cut costs in an effort to balance budgets, which they in fact failed to do in almost every single year. And some examples of that um, were killing the lifetime uh, uh, pensions for veterans, uh, closing nine Veterans Affairs offices throughout the country, 
And in fact, it was the Auditor General who found that the previous Conservative government failed veterans, noting the percentage of returned soldiers with mental health issues had actually increased sixfold between 2002 and 2014. The Conservatives um, slashed 900 jobs despite pleas from managers from various different departments in Veterans Affairs not to do that um, because of the impacts that that would have in uh, delivering services to veterans. The Conservatives clawed back nearly a billion dollars from, the vet from Veterans Affairs, generally speaking. And in fact, the courts ordered the Conservative government to pay $887 million to vets. The court, Mr. Speaker, had to order the conser previous Conservative government to pay vets. <clears throat> But, uh, Mr. Speaker, we come to, uh, to where we are today and what we're trying to do. And, of course, when you look at the record and ten, the 10 years of the, the, the failure of a decade, uh, perhaps we could, could, could call it, when you look at the failure of a decade uh, with the Conservative government as it related to veterans, this isn't something that you're just going to flip the switch on and um, be able to bring back all the services immediately, especially when you talk about the money that was stripped from the department, the, the employees that were um, fired and terminated from within the department. But not only has this gov government worked in re-establishing the services that existed 10 years ago, but has also surpassed those services in many regards. The service that our veterans provided to our nation is, as I said earlier, invaluable, and this government understands that. And there have been no costs that have been spared in rewarding their service for providing our veterans with the quality of life that they deserve. So let's talk about some of those things. The, the accomplishments in the budget of 2016. We invested, this government, $5.7 billion to provide veterans with better financial security by increasing income replacement from 75% to 90% of veterans' pre-release uh, pre salary and increasing the annual maximum pain and suffering compensation. We reopened offices. Not only did we open, reopen all nine offices that were closed in uh, Cornerbrook, uh, Newfoundland, Brandon, Manitoba, Sydney, Nova Scotia, Kelowna, BC, Saskatoon, S Saskatchewan, Charlottetown, PEI, Thunder Bay, Ontario, Windsor, Ontario, and Prince George, uh, BC. We reopened all nine of those. And then in addition to that, opened another one in Surrey, BC, and expanded outreach, which expanded outreach into the north. Veterans Affairs staff are now able to travel to territories and to northern communities monthly to meet with veterans and their families. Some, a little bit closer to home, Mr. Speaker, in eastern Ontario, of the nine offices that were reopened, two of them were in Ontario, in Thunder Bay, um, and Windsor. Um, we, uh, um, we've seen that the, that the, re, that the open, uh, reopened office in Thunder Bay has brought up to seven additional frontline staff to the province to improve the access to veterans. The Thunder Bay office serves approximately 1,700 veterans, as well as enable approximately 70 veterans who uh, work with case managers to meet with them in person. Some of the other things, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, of the 900 staff that were terminated from Veterans Affairs, 460 new staff have been brought on. And, we, and this government has a commitment to making sure that we can move from the 40 to 1 ratio of veterans to caseworkers to the 25 to 1. 40 to, 40 to 1 is where the previous government left us. 40 veterans for every caseworker. And we are moving and have made significant progress. I believe we're around 30 uh, veterans per caseworker now. And we are moving towards that 25 to 1 uh, ratio. Pensions for life. We committed to bringing back pensions for life to make things simpler, make services simpler, and that's exactly what's been done. Veterans whose services, uh, whose service and sacrifice results in illness or injuries now get up to monthly tax-free pension for life of $1,150. Veterans who are, injured great, uh, who are greatly injured and uh, impact uh, on their quality of life can receive an additional $1,500 a month tax-free for life. Veterans whose injuries prevent them from finding uh, gainful work uh, will now get the income replacement benefit, providing 90% of a veteran's pre-release salary monthly indexed annually. Um, in addition to that, and I know I'm running out of time, Mr. Speaker, um, uh, we have provided various different other services uh, for our veterans. So I guess what I'm trying to say here, Mr. Speaker, is despite the fact of the um, political gaming with this particular issue, and it is an extremely unfortunate one, um, this government has been absolutely committed to veterans. 
and has not only been restoring what the conser previous Conservative government removed from veterans, but has, going, has been going above and beyond that. I'm extremely proud of this government's reputation on the veterans file, and I look forward to continuing to work on this because, as I said earlier, there will never be enough that we can do for veterans, and we must always strive to do more and better for those who gave us the incredible quality of life that we have. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Bravo. Questions and comments? The Honourable Member for Kamloops, Thompson, Caribou. Um, you know, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And t today the debate has been uh, certainly concerning and very puzzling, and it really revolves around this government's response from the very beginning. Sometimes things happen that are very unusual and clearly, clearly wrong. And I want to go back to an example when uh, people heard that Clifford Olson was receiving OAS. The immediate response of the Prime Minister was, I've instructed the Minister to look at what options are available to us, rectify the situation because it should be rectified. Now, it took a little while to make sure it was rectified in a way that didn't have unintended consequences, but it was recognized from the offset that this was wrong and that it needed to be rectified. What is it with the Liberals in this government that could have continued to try and defend and hide behind all sorts of ridiculous arguments in this particular case? It's wrong. It should be rectified. Why are they not willing to go there for so many weeks? The Honourable Member for Kingston and the Islands. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I'm glad to get this question because the reality of the situation is it was the Veterans Charter in 2006 that the Conservative government brought in that extended benefits that extended benefits to um, the, uh, the, serv the veterans' families. And it, and, uh, the, what, it hadn't been changed since 2011, but it was the extension of those benefits that actually enabled what happened and what they're, they're talking about in this motion. In my opinion, uh, Mr. Speaker, this House is about policy setting, and we should create good policy. If you want to have a discussion about what should be in that charter to trigger certain uh, aspects of it to remove somebody's ability to, to, to access the benefits, then we should have that discussion. We should have that policy debate. But the reality of the matter is, is that it was the Conservatives that brought in this piece of legislation that has enabled uh, what, what uh, we're here debating today. Questions and comments? The Honourable Member for New Westminster, Burnaby. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And uh, I'm certainly not going to defend the Conservatives' record on Veterans Affairs, uh, but I think it's uh, a bit egregious for the Liberals to try to pretend they're any better. If we look at the ratio of caseworkers to veterans right now, let's take three cities. Kingston, one.